My name is Ron, and I'm going to interview Father Dale this morning. Um, Father Dale, you've had a long lifetime of experiences. Could you give us an example of one of your earlier experiences that led you to the life of Christ? Well, this is a story I don't tell often. But when I was young and just out of college, I returned home to the family farm. I felt confused and lost. But I truly believe I heard the voice of God. One day I was walking out into the back field to bring in some heifers. As I walked toward the end of the field, I saw a log that had washed up from the river. And on that log were a pair of robins. As I approached it, I noticed that the robins didn't fly away. And as I got closer, I began to wonder if my eyes were playing tricks on me. I was wondering if they even were birds or robins. And as I got closer, I heard a voice. The voice said, what you believe is what you see. You see, most of my life I have been living by the opposite principle. I have been living by the theme, what you see is what you believe. But this voice said, what you believe is what you see. And just at that moment, a hawk came down from the sky, grabbed one of the robins in its talons and began to fly away. And the voice said, what you believe is what you see. Just at that moment, a pair of crows came flying in, attacking the hawk. The hawk now dropped the robin, now lifeless to the ground. And then I heard the voice again, what you believe is what you see. If you believe the world to be good, you will see the crows coming in to save the life of the robin. If you believe the world to be evil, you will see the crows coming in to steal away a common food. What you believe is what you see. It was very important, I knew at that moment, to work on my beliefs, because that would shape how I see the world. In that moment, I knew I must return to college and spend the rest of my life working on what my basic principles and beliefs were. God had instructed me. God had called me to a life of believing. I have a question uh, regarding Christ and your seeking out his path and his state of mind and what he taught. Mm. Um, would you give us a little bit of what you found in the years of exploring? Well, yes. Uh, Christ was both human and divine. Now, over the years and centuries, Christians have interpreted this in many ways. Some see Christ as more human than divine. At other times, and other church fathers and mothers have seen him more divine than human. This has always uh, been confusing, but to me, this is what proves that Jesus is God. He was both human and divine. You see, if Christ had only been divine, as a human being, we would not be able to relate to God. If he was merely a man who became God, uh, of course, this was found to be a heresy, Again, we would just see this as an elevation of humanity or the elevation of man. No, Christ was both divine and human. This is the great genius. We see this on the quadratic cross that Syriac Christianity lifts up. This is a budded cross with, with each arm of the cross having buds. This shows that there is life in the cross. I love the imagery of the Syriac church. It gives me life, just as Christ gives me life. Father Dale, um, Thank you. I want to ask you about history. Uh, most of us know uh, the uh, history of the Bible, but if you dig deeper and you have, uh, explain to us how history can prove the story much more complex, and get, uh, for an example. Yes. I think one of the best examples is perhaps the story of the Magi. Um, there are many traditions and many stories that were never included in the Bible, but are just as true. For example, the Book of Barnabas was a 
book that was written about the time of Christ, actually shortly after, and it actually should have been included in the Bible. Unfortunately, it has a story of the phoenix in it, and early Christians did not believe this was appropriate, so the book was not included. Another story is the story of the Magi. This I learned from my experiences of living in Mor Gabriel in the Middle East. It is a tradition that there were not three Magi that came to visit Jesus and brought him gifts. There were in fact 12 Magi. They actually stopped in a place in Turabdin and decided to send only three of the 12. The other Magi remained there. The three Magi went and gave their gifts to Jesus of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And when they returned to Turabdin, they brought with them the swaddling clothes, or literally the diapers of Jesus. They took those diapers, and because they were Zoroastrian, they threw them on a fire. Fire was sacred, ancient, cleansing. And as they looked into the fire, the swaddling clothes, or the diapers, had turned into gold medallions. Each medallion had a face of one of the Magi on it. This is a story that we tell quite often in the Syriac Orthodox Church. I love these traditions, I love these stories, and many of them should have been included in the Bible. Um, the history of Christianity as we know it, or as um, the Western culture knows it, is incomplete. Could you explain uh, a more overall better look at Christianity in the past uh, history? Yes, I think in some ways his Christianity has been identified with the West, essentially Europe. And in a way, this is a, a narrow and maybe even perverted view of the total history of Christianity. Scholars and writers like myself are discovering a wider and deeper history of Christianity. As we read in the book of Acts, there were people from all over the world that came to Jerusalem shortly after the death and resurrection of Christ. In fact, in the first thousand years of Christianity, the bulk of Christianity, the greater demographic of Christianity, was in the East, not in the West. From Jerusalem to China, there were far more Christians in the first thousand years than in any or all of Europe. There were single provinces in China or Central Asia that had more Christians than the entire Holy Roman Empire. Many of my books and writings are about this lost and forgotten history. As Christians, I think we have a duty to Christ to see that his message was universal and he had reached human hearts throughout all of human history, not just a narrow Western view. Um. I wanted to ask you, uh, when you go to around the world helping people, yeah. do you, are you sent by a bishop or do you just find yourself there by ha happenstance? Um, no, uh, over 40 years of ministry, I found myself in the midst of chaos, war, famine, hunger. For example, when I asked Bishop Samuel, where should I go to be trained as a priest? He said, I'm sending you to Eastern Turkey. I thought he was sending me to the end of the world. He sent me to Mor Gabriel Monastery. And it seemed like, it, it really did seem like the end of the world. I arrived on August 2nd, 1990, which was the day Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. And suddenly I found myself unable to leave the country even if I wanted to. I was stuck in a place that was now under the veil and the cloud of war. Later in my ministry, I was called to China. An earthquake in 2010 happened in China. And by this time, I had done a lot of jobs for the World Council of Churches. They sent me to China. When I got to China, I found out they didn't have much use for me. China is a very capable country. And so realizing that I was not going to be able to do very much, I took a job in a local university. And from there, 
i discovered hundreds if not thousands of students who needed my direction and help it was one of the great periods of my ministry and my life god has always sent me into places of war places of earthquakes even hurricanes in the dominican republic a hurricane hit and suddenly there were hundreds of children who were in the streets i spent the first week during that hurricane helping people pick up the dead off the street these families often left children destitute so i set up an orphanage and we took care and fed children for several years i raised money to build the orphanage i raised money to pay employees i raised money to help feed these children. And then I brought university students from the United States, mostly the Eastern United States, to come in and help these children. Eventually, like I do in a lot of my ministries, I turned it over to more competent organizations. I'm good at starting things. I'm good at helping fund things. And God has used these special skills and has given me these special skills to assist and literally save the lives of many. To speak to us of how God works in your life, um, like in the Dominican Republic, the orphanage that you had set up some 10, 12 years prior, uh, and how you found yourself in great need, uh, unknown to you. Uh, could you speak to that, please? Well, it has taken a lifetime to understand how God has called me. After many years in the Middle East and serving Christians who were victims of war, Gulf War I and Gulf War II, I found myself called to other parts of the world. Five years in China, teaching in a university, serving people who had been in an earthquake. I found myself called to the Dominican Republic, literally on the other side of the world. I arrived there at the same time a hurricane hit the area. There were thousands of people desperate for food. I spent the first week when I was back there picking up dead bodies, taking them to a mass morgue, a mass grave. Once we stabilized the health situation, I realized there were hundreds if not thousands of children without parents literally orphans. I recalled in my own life how I was an orphan, and I knew that I must rescue them by starting an orphanage. I raised money. I called people to help. They came and gathered around me, and we built orphanages, both in the Dominican Republic and in Haiti. This was in a long line of orphanages I have built over the years and raised money for. Christ has a ministry for each one of us. And I ask you today to look at your life, to look at how God called you, not to resent any situation that you're in. It could be a situation of war. It could be a desperate situation where you're displaced. Embrace it, and God will give you the gifts to minister to it. Oh, 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 oh,